Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. I'm Aris Benedict. Today's session is going to be a little sample of our bonus content that we're going to make for Patreon subscribers. Here's how it works. If you sign up at the Flash Fiction, Short Story, or Novelette tier, we'll offer you a little bit of critique every month on something you're working on. Getting critiqued and listening to someone else get critiqued can be a really valuable way to develop that critical gaze that's so important to being a good writer. Writing is rewriting, and being able to examine a work for flaws is essential for the rewriting process. So if you want us to take a look at your work, or if you just want to listen in on a critique session, head over to patreon.com slash writegood and sign up. Now, let's get to it. For our sample session, we're going to take a look at a work beloved to fans of genre fiction, the famous Eye of Argon by the immortal wordsmith Jim Tice. I'm starting at the beginning, and I'm setting the timer for five minutes, and let's go. The weather-beaten trail wound ahead into the dust-racked climbs of the barren land which dominates large portions of the Norgolian Empire. Age-worn hoofprints smothered by the sifting sands of time shone dully against the dust-splattered crust of earth. Okay, already I am noticing an excessive use of modifiers, adjectives. Um, just about every noun here is preceded by at least one adjective or some something similar to that, and that's excessive. You don't need to do that. It's better to pick strong nouns, strong concrete nouns. Not to mention splatter is kind of a weird word to use for dust. Dust doesn't really splatter. Splatter is kind of kind of a wet word, and dust is not wet. And you're referring to the sifting, shan the sifting sands of time, but it sounds like you're actually talking about actual sand, in which case it's not metaphorical, so I'm not sure if I'd say the sifting sands of time would work. Not to mention... Age-worn hoof prints are are shining. That that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like hoof prints don't really shine. Um, also, how how would you have really old hoof prints in in dust? Dust doesn't really hold a a print very well. Okay, moving on. Next line: The tireless sun cast its parching rays of incandescence from overhead halfway through its da daily revolution. Small rodents scampered about, occupying themselves in the daily accomplishments of their dismal lives. Now, if this is a desert scene, why are rodents scampering around? There's not a lot of rodents in, in the desert. And rodent is kind of a vague word. Like, why not just say a type of rat or something? This is a fantasy setting, so this would be a really good opportunity to introduce some of the weird fantastic flora and fauna here. Dust sprayed over three heaving mounts in blinding clouds while they bore the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. All right. Um, three heaving mounts. I get that this, this is a euphemism for horses, but it, it, it's a little hard to tell that. Um, just say horse. Just say horse. You can just say horse. I'm, I'm sensing something we call a uh, thesaurus syndrome, where we think, oh, I can't use a simple word. A simple word's not smart sounding enough. Let me use a synonym for it. But synonyms don't mean the exact same thing. And sometimes you end up saying something that isn't exactly what you want it to be. Plus, Heaving mounts um, almost sounds like a double entendre, so that's kind of unintentionally going to make your, your readers giggle a little bit. You don't want to do that. Also, the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. Say rider, not, not overseer, just say rider, it's straightforward. And the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. Again, that's too many adjectives, but also it's a little ambiguous, is... Now, is the struggling overseer uh, the cargo himself, or is he carrying cargo on top of that? Anyway, here's the first line of dialogue. Prepare to embrace your creators in the Stygian haunts of hell, barbarian, gasped the first soldier. Okay, 
Uh, that's a lot to, to yell. Um, that's, that's a very, that's quite a, a, a lot of trash talk. That's a big mouth full of trash talk. Um, usually when people are exerting themselves, they speak in clipped sentences and also gasp the first soldier. You can't gasp an entire sentence like that. It, it would sound like, prepare to embrace your creators in the city now. Like that, no. Scream, shout, not, not gasp. Okay, and here's the response. Only after you have kissed the fleeting stead of death, wretch, returned Grigner. So, the dialogue, um, I get that this is fantasy dialogue, but it's still a bit, uh, wooden, and if our, our hero Grigner is a barbarian, I, I imagine he wouldn't speak in such sort of flowery, fancy language, um, only if you... Oh, that's the timer. And our five minutes is up. So next we're going to take a look at a classic romance novel by Amanda McKittrick Ross, Irene Idlesley. It was basically the room of the 19th century. So let's set our timer for five minutes and let's go. Chapter one. Sympathize with me indeed. Ah, no, cast your sympathy on the chill waves of troubled waters. Fling it on the oasis of futurity. Dash it against the rock of gossip. Or better still, allow it to remain within the false and faithless bosom of buried scorn. Such were a few remarks of Irene as she paced the beach of limited freedom, alone and unprotected. Sympathy can wound the breast of trodden patience. It hath no rival to ensure the feelings we possess, save that of sorrow. All right, so there's a couple of things to, to note uh, starting off. Um, I don't know what on the oasis of futurity, the rock of gossip, are supposed to be. Uh, these metaphors, well, mixed, generally kind of mixed metaphors, although there's a there's a there's a beach there's a beach theme um so the faithless bosom of buried scorn doesn't really fit in at the beach i guess um but i'm i'm noticing some uh, off a, a little repetitious diction here or a sentence structure we're using this the x of y the x of y the x of y metaphor over and over and over again for instance, you can say sympathy can wound the breast of trodden patience, but you could just say sympathy can wound one's patience. It'd be a little more straightforward. All right, moving on. The gloomy mansion stands firmly within the ivy-covered, stoutly built walls of Dunfern, vast in proportion and magnificent in display. It has been built over 300 years, and its structure stands respectably distant from modern advancement, and in some degrees it could boast of architectural designs rarely, if ever, attempted since its construction. Okay, that's not bad. Um, description's a little bit vague, like I'm having trouble picturing the place, but that, that, okay, whatever, that's okay. The entrance to this beautiful home of Sir Hugh Dunfern, the present owner, is planned on most antique principles. Nothing save an enormous iron gate meets the gaze of the visitor, who at first is inclined to think that all public rumors relative to its magnificence are only the utterances of the boastful and idle. Nor until within its winding paths of finest pebble, studded here and there with huge stones of unpolished granite, could the mind, for a moment, conceive or entertain the faintest idea of its quaint grandeur. All right, um, I realize this is an older text, but generally you might want to start with a little bit more of a hook than here's a house, and, and maybe if the house could uh, set some kind of really exciting or entrancing mood, like maybe if it was a spooky murder house, that would be pretty interesting, but this probably won't suck the reader in too well. You're going you're gonna to lose the reader. All right, moving on. Beautiful, however, as Dunfern Mansion may be seem to the anxious eye of the beholder, yet it is not altogether free from mystery. 
Whilst many of its rooms, with walls of crystal, are gorgeously and profusely furnished, others are locked incessantly against the foot of the cautious intruder, having in them only a few traditional relics of no material consequence whatsoever, or even interest to any outside the ancestral line of its occupants. All right. You, you said it's not. F this place is not altogether free from mystery, but that these mysteries are of not any consequence. It, it it doesn't really excite the reader to hear. Oh, there's stuff in the rooms, but but it, it it's not interesting. Don't tell the reader that they shouldn't be interested of something. Also, walls of crystal isn't that kind of fragile, and so it's like a transparent house. I don't really think that's a thing people do. Unless that's a metaphor, although it's a bit of a questionable metaphor. It has often been the chief subject of comment amongst... Okay, stop doing the amongst and whilst and winced stuff. It, it, it's a little hokey. It has often been the chief subject of comment amongst the few distinguished visitors welcomed within its spacious apartments. Why seemingly the finest rooms of the mansion owned were always shut against their eager and scrutinizing gaze, or why, when referred to by any of them, the matter was always treated with silence. Okay, so you are setting up questions that the reader might show some interest in. That That's all right. That That's not bad. All that can now be done is merely to allow the thought to dwindle into bleak oblivion. Until aroused to that standard of disclosure which defies hindrance, uh, there's there's a whole lot of thesaurus syndrome going on here. There, it, it, slightly plainer language would, would make a an easier read. Using too many $10 words, I know it's intended to make you sound smart, but it can actually make a writers sound very insecure and overcompensating. But the five minutes is up because that was the timer. So that is all for this session. If you'd like to listen in on future sessions or have your work critiqued, sign up on patreon.com slash R-I-T-G-U-D. In our next episode, we're going to talk about dark humor. I'm Aris Benedict, and that jingling sound was my cat, Harley. Thank you for listening. Good night. This has been Right Good with R.S. Benedict, hosted by R.S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. For comments and concerns, please write to us at rightgood at kittysneezes.com. That's R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittysneezes.com. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash rightgood. <laughs> Kitty sneezes.com in color. <laughs> <laughs>